And if you're calling plays, uh, you have to have a great relationship and understanding of each other. You know, you've got to get to the point where the QB understands why you're calling certain things, but you also have to call things that you know that that QB can execute and believe in. Bird Wright, 18 premium diesel. Joe Montana, Buster Douglas, John Elway, John Elway. Daisy right, Soy, Blitz right, Travolta right, Pumpkin left, Alert Charlotte left. Go on. Punch right, Zach. We'll go 15 tip scissors. Can it to 300 jet F stick. Victory is a great play call. All right, coaches, welcome back to another episode of the Play Callers Club. We are fired up. We have a really special guest to share with you today, the head coach of the SMU Mustangs, Rhett Lashley. Coach Lashley, welcome, man. We really appreciate you jumping on with us. Man, excited to, to get to come on. I enjoy following uh, a lot of the things you post and uh, some really good stuff. So excited to talk some ball. For sure, man. Well, you've been you've been on there a lot since uh, your days at Auburn and Miami. I mean, you've you've been on there a lot for sure. I've been been tracking pretty closely but what i really want to do is i want to take you way back in the day here real quick to 1999 in arkansas you're you're playing for shiloh christian and you guys end up playing a team junction city i probably watched that youtube clip man like 10 times of that wild and crazy game do you mind uh telling some of our listeners a little bit about that junction city game in 99 yeah, you did some research there. I didn't know I we did, were going man, all the way back to 99. I mean, we're talking a quarter <laughs> century ago. Um, yeah, so it was Yeah, it was my sophomore year at Shiloh, and, and Gus Malzahn was our head coach. And <clears throat> we had just won the school's first state championship the year before when I was a freshman. And uh, that quarterback, Josh Floyd, who's coach at Hewitt Trustful now in, in outside of Birmingham, had just graduated. So his first year as a starter, and here we are, number one in the state, playing number two, Junction City, in the – I think it was the quarterfinals. It was Thanksgiving yep. weekend. We had to go down to their place. And, uh, you know, we threw it all over the place, and they could run it all over the place. Oh, yeah. And uh, there wasn't a lot of defense played. But, you know, it had been pretty easy. I think we were like 12-0 and 0 at that point. And I'm like, hey, man, this starting quarterback deal in high school is pretty cool, pretty easy. And uh, we showed up there, and it was we had just come in from warm-ups. And Junction City is like on the border of Arkansas, Louisiana. There's not much there. And someone had – in town had hit the telephone pole or the uh, electrical poles and knocked out the power at the stadium. <laughs> the lights right. went out. And so the game was delayed like almost an hour. Holy we come God. out, kick off about eight, eight thirty. no scoreboard, no clock. They got the lights on and we start playing and we're down 24 to nothing before I think we even knew what happened. Like, <laughs> I think we like went through, they scored, we didn't score. They scored. I threw a pick. They scored, and we're like – and they went for two every time, and it's 24 to nothing, and we're like – I remember standing on the sidelines thinking, I'm not ready to start basketball on Monday. <laughs> and um, – but, man, we, we started coming back, and we ended up throwing for 672 yards. I think they rushed for close to that. And uh, we scored with like a minute and a half to go to take the lead. We ended up winning 70 to 64. And I remember Holy we scored, cow. I'm like asking their official, hey, how much time's left? Because the, the, the scoreboard never turned on the whole <laughs> game. So you're kind of keeping the score in your head. And uh, that was quite a quite a wild experience and moment. I think it won national game of the year, but, but not for the defensive uh, <laughs> performances. Uh, certainly not. But no, I mean, I think as any young coach starting out, I know this is my, my story for sure, as a young high school coach, looking for mentors, people to kind of look up to that have walked that path before. Gus Malzahn's name obviously jumps off the page of like a guy that started at a small, a small school in Arkansas, worked his way up into the college ranks. Obviously, you know, wins national championship and all that. What was it like playing for him in the late '90s, early 2000s, when you guys were doing stuff that really nobody was doing at that time, uh, or at least it wasn't nearly yeah. as popular as it is now? No, it was fun. <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm a an eighth and ninth grade quarterback and we were no huddling in junior high crazy and as a quarterback that's your dream and playing fast and i threw it 71 times in a game twice which is funny because gus runs a ball a lot in college oh, a ton, yeah. 71 times in a game twice <laughs> um you know and i think it was like him and there was art Briles in texas and mm-hmm. you know there wasn't a whole lot of others at that time doing a lot of that and they really were pioneers you know it was fun because um coach is driven like he's just he, everywhere he's been, he was successful and worked his way all the way to, to where he's been able to go. And um, But playing for him was great because he was hard on us. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, he didn't cuss, he didn't demean you, but man, he expected the best from you at all times, demanded it and didn't accept anything less. And at times that was frustrating. You know, at times you're like, you know, bad mouth him under your breath when he can't hear you because <laughs> you're mad at him. But at the same time, you appreciated it because he was pushing you to be the best you could be. And, you know, so yeah, I'd be nine out of 10 and he'd be screaming, I'm killing us. The quarterback's killing us because he just missed a throw. And I'm like, I'm nine out of 10. Like, what are we right. talking about? You know, but that's how he was. He just demanded your best. And that's, but what I think helped us respect him is he demanded the same thing of himself. Yeah. And, and clearly we won and, and, and we knew he cared about us. It, like mm -hmm. I said, he was hard on us, but he cared about us and he made us all the best version of ourselves. For sure. So you, you know, I, I think did you end up winning three state championships we as did, a quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. And so you kind of parlay some of that success into an opportunity to play quarterback at University of Arkansas, kind of the, the hometown team. You, you went through some injuries. What, what was kind of your injury situation in, in college? Well, I, I was Matt Jones's water boy in college. I was a really <laughs> good, go. I was a really good wingman for him in the QB room. I didn't play a whole lot. I got in a few games. Um, so my senior year of high school, actually, in our second game, I dislocated my throwing shoulder. Um, it actually came out, had to be put back in. We had a Monday night game. It's weird because the next day was 9-11. I remember it so vividly. You wake up the next Crazy. day and 9-11 happened. Uh, and then we had a game that Friday night. And, I I mean, I'm a quarterback, dislocated my shoulder. I was actually playing defense at the time when I got hurt. So it wasn't great going into our third game. And uh, senior year, we had a team. We thought we'd win state and go out the right way. And so I, for the first time in my career, I'm, like, not even dressed out to play. And we're starting our sophomore. And we, we're getting beat pretty good at half, which we won quite a bit. So it was not good. So we go in at halftime. I got ticked off, got dressed out, went out, warmed up on Friday night with just sheer adrenaline. I had tried to throw Thursday. I couldn't throw it more than 10 yards and right. went out and, and played the whole second half and ended up playing the rest of the season for about wow. the next five weeks. I didn't, I didn't practice. I just showed up on Fridays, got real amped up and went and played. And then it kind of settled in, but then it came out again twice in our semifinal game that year. Uh, ironically, we were playing junction city at home this time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then I played the championship game, and then it came out once in basketball. So it came out four times, and I had to have it fixed as I was going to college. So I had the surgery going in and was kind of halfway in my rehab my freshman year. And I just never really got it back to the level I needed to. And uh, But I wouldn't change anything because we did win state that senior year. And there you go. Worth. Yeah, you <laughs> laid it on the line. So when did you know that coaching was kind of the next step for you, transitioning from a player to being on the sidelines? Kind of always in the back of my mind wanted to coach. Now yep. I wanted to be Joe Montana, so I wanted to play as long <laughs> Gotta as I could. Got to get that out of the way first. <laughs> um, so, but again, I tore my shoulder up, ended up going to Arkansas. I played sparingly, um, and so it was pretty evident, you know, hey, this is going to end pretty quick. Um, I did. I grew up. I really um, kind of. They weren't my mentors, but people I looked up to were Bobby Bowden, Mark Ridd. Mm -hmm. I love Bill Walsh in NFL, and and those were guys that that made me want to coach, uh, or just be associated with the game whenever playing ended. And so, when I knew it was ending, you know, kind of late in college, it just worked out the timing to where Houston Nutt was my college coach. Gus Malzahn got hired in '06 to be his offensive coordinator. Right as I was kind of finishing up my senior year and eligibility and all that, and it's like, well, sweet, I can go GA. Yeah, uh, in Arkansas, and that's that's how I was able to get in. That's that's a pretty pretty uh, serendipitous uh, link up with with Coach Malzahn there at Arkansas. At that point, did you, were you pretty sure that the college game was for you, or were you thinking you may want to be a high school coach, NFL? Like, how do you how were you kind of processing that decision at the time? Yeah, I don't know if I really knew for sure. I did. I knew I wanted to try college, and I don't know. I've never really had this drive to go to the NFL. I love the NFL. Yeah, I just I sure. haven't, and that doesn't mean that I won't one day or never. I don't know. I just I've always been drawn to the college game. Yeah. Um, I, and I obviously wouldn't rule out coaching high school. I, I coached quarterbacks for two years at one time in a high school for another one of my coaches. So like. I, I just love the game, but I like the college and the high school level because you're still impacting young men. Yeah. In that kind of 16 to 23 year old range, as opposed to the, the professional piece of the NFL. Um, so I kind of thought I wanted college and I also felt like, man, take your shot at college first. And if it doesn't work out, yeah. 
you have a better chance at, at maybe getting a high school job, but it's hard to go from high school to college like Gus did. I mean, a lot of people haven't done Very that. Hard. Yeah. And, uh, and, and look, I was fortunate to get the opportunity. You know, there's a lot of great coaches out there that have never gotten that opportunity. I was just blessed to, to know the right people at the right time and, and get an opportunity. For sure. Yeah. So Gus ends up going from University of Arkansas up to Tulsa, I believe. Yeah. Um, what was what was your transition like when he went from Arkansas to Tulsa? Well, it's a long story. I'll try to make it really, really short. Yeah, for sure. So for I sure. was going with him. I GA'd one year at Arkansas. We won 10 games, had Darren McFadden, that whole deal. Right. But he's leaving to go kind of run his style of offense. And so yeah. he's going to go be the OC at Tulsa for Todd Graham. I go over there. Uh, I'm going to be a GA, but I'm going to get to coach the running backs. It's like a no-brainer. It's, a, it's yeah. a dream. I'm like 24 years old. I go over there one day. He does his press conference. We meet the head coach. We do all this. We're driving back. And – there's been about three or four times in my life this has happened. Uh, the way I call plays is the same. I'm a feel guy. I there don't you go. <laughs> necessarily color inside the lines all the time. Um, yeah. And we're driving back to Northwest Arkansas, and in my gut I'm going, I, I can't do this. It's not right. Something yeah. about it. I can't I, – I couldn't explain it then, and I won't try to now. So I get out of the car. I, I call Cus. I'm like, I don't think I'm going to do this, which – he didn't like. He was like, "No, think about it." I think about it for two or three days, or thought about it for two or three days, and I just, I knew it made no sense. My dad, everybody I talked to, I, I sought all the counsel I could. They're like, "I know this makes no sense. I'm ending my college coaching career. Right? I can't go do. I'm just. It, it's not right. I don't know what to tell you, but my gut tells me absolutely not, and I'm trusting it. Mm-hmm. So I didn't do it. So then I was out, and that's when I started. Um, figuring out I got to get a job. I was just getting married. I had to get a job. And so I got a job kind of in a sports marketing company at the same time. was coaching high school a little bit on the side from other, uh, one of my coaches. And, um, but it wasn't about three to six months in. I knew, man, I, I got a coach. And got, I didn't know yeah, if I'd get another it. chance. Um, fortunately, you know, Gus called me about four months later. And said, "Hey, I don't think you made a bad decision. Whatever." And then two years later, a year and a half later, we were able to go to Auburn, and I was able to get back in. So, yeah. Uh, the best thing for me, though, I'll say, is I didn't know why, and I still maybe know why. I believed, I just trusted my gut. The first two years I was married, I, married, I wasn't a coach. Yeah. Now my I GA a year I was engaged, but then we were married for almost twenty two months before I got back into coaching, and to have that foundation was really unique for yeah. us because of the demands that come in a coaching life. And it also let my wife know, like, no, no, you got to go. She's like, you need to go do this. I'm like, sweet. Thanks. So (laughs) uh, so I was able to get back in. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. So when I go back through like almost every off season, I feel like I inevitably am just drawn. It's like this gravitational pool to go watch the 2013 Auburn run game because you guys did so many (laughs) cool things. Uh, what was it like kind of being on the ground floor of some of that stuff? Because that was, I mean, to this day, like I, I think it's a timeless offense and you guys did some incredible stuff. And it's not complicated. No, uh, no. You know, obviously we we had Nick Marshall who could really he hurt helps. you in the zone read game <laughs> and could throw the deep ball. So yep. you couldn't just sit everybody down there. He wasn't going to pick you apart, but he could run by you and he could throw it over your head. And yeah. And then we had, you know, we had Trey Mason, good running back, a really good O line. We had Greg Robinson at tackle and Jay Prosh at, at fullback. And he was really mm-hmm. kind of the, the glue or the, the straw that stirred the drink because he's a 265 pound fullback. You know, I mean, that's like Those basically nice. an offensive guard. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then we had some wide. So we kind of had the pieces to run that exact style of system. I think it, it speaks a lot to, to Gus and his strengths is, and one of the things I've learned from him is, you know, you're going to have a system or a style of play like we have and like we had then, and then you're going to have an identity. But within that, you have to have the flexibility to not compromise your system, your scheme, your style, at the same time taking full advantage and tailoring your system year in, year out to your players and their strengths. And, you know, we were totally different in 2010 with Cam Newton than we were in 2013 with Nick Marshall, and they both worked right. pretty well. No and, man, to your point, we got on a run running the football. We could, we were telling the University of Alabama we're about to run the football, and we were running it right <laughs> over them. And th- you don't do that. And no, um, no. it was wild. And we just did all the right things to compliment the guys bought into the style. And, I mean, it was almost like triple option football, but out of a spread. And, um, 
yeah, it was pretty fun till it ended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I sincerely mean it when I say every off season, I, I get sucked back down that rabbit hole and always enjoy it. But it's interesting for me as a, as a coach now, kind of being on the other side of things, you mentioned as a high school player, throwing it 71 times in a game, a couple times, like, is there, how, how do you kind of sort out in your own head from a philosophical perspective this is kind of what we want to be offensively. Is it always based on the players or obviously you have things you've, you've had success with in the past that you kind of tailor it to going yeah. from throwing it around a ton and being successful in high school as a player to running <laughs> over the university of Alabama and having success at the college level. How do you, how do you sort that out in your own head? Yeah, I think, you know, I think you have a philosophy that you want to be. And I think it's easier in college than high school because we recruit, to for what sure. we want to yeah. be. Now, in high school, I have so much respect for high school coaches. Their job's so much harder because one year you may have, you know, a guy like a Mitch Mustaine who can be the Gatorade National Player of the Year and throw it all over the yard. And the next year, you may not have a quarterback at your school. Yeah. And you got to take your best athlete, put him at quarterback, and figure it out, right? And so it's different there. Um, but I think those times in that background helps in college when you go, okay, we can recruit to our system, but within that system, we can still play to the strengths of our players. Um, you know, philosophically that helped me because my brain's always been wired to throw the football quarterback yeah. in, in space and coverage. And that's why, you know, we throw a lot more now than I did when we were Gus, but with Gus, I got to throw a lot when I played, which was great for me and my development. But two, I learned over those years the, how to run the football. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that combination, I believe in balance. And I don't believe in balances in like 50-50. I believe in balances and you can take what the defense gives you. And, you know, there's been games where we had to throw it for 400 and games we had to run it for 300. And, and those are yeah. rare. But if someone says, we're going to take this away, you have to be able to do the other. Because if a defense can make you one-dimensional – it's probably a wrap. And um, we were one-dimensional my first year here at SMU, and we threw for all kinds of yards, but we only went seven and five. Yeah. You know, last year we were more balanced. Um, but that's that's going to change year to year. One year you may be a little more run heavy, a little more pass heavy, but they have to be able to complement each other so you don't become one-dimensional. And a fun way to say it is, you know, I think you got to throw the ball to score and run the ball to win. Love that. Yep. No, I, I completely agree. It's It's been a, a – kind of a challenge for me as a coach learning you know there were years where teams that I coached we could throw it all over the place but when it came down to it and we had to have you know a third and two or something like that I always would get a little queasy calling plays there mm -hmm. and it's really nice the teams you have where it's like third and two you know we can we can go duo inside zone and, and we're, we're good to go or run some count or something like that it's yep. it gives you a lot of peace of mind as a coordinator that's for sure being able to do stuff like that yep Absolutely. So as a, as a player play for coach Malzahn as a coach, kind of he's, he's, he gets your foot in the door and you are able to work with him for a while. Did you ever feel at a certain point, like, Hey, I need to go set out on my own and kind of do things my own way. Yeah. What was, how was that internal dialogue like for you as a coach trying to figure out your own, your own philosophy? Well, it was, it was a challenge. Um, you definitely get to that point. I was blessed. You know, coach gave me a lot of opportunities and we were at Auburn. And then I, I went away for one year in 2011 and worked for Pat Sullivan at Sanford, which yep. was super cool. Yeah. A former Heisman Trophy winner and just an incredible man. And so I was one year away. We actually ended the year playing Auburn, which was really awkward. And, uh, <laughs> and then Gus got the Arkansas State job the very next year and, and yeah. took me to be the OC there. So I was right back with him there. And then we went to Auburn for those four years we've talked about. And it was really about 2015. Um, I had an opportunity. I was going to be able to go interview with, a, I'll leave it out, but an ACC school. Yeah. And, and really it was more or less than an interview. It was more like, hey, come meet with me and I want you to be our offensive coordinator. And it's like, well, why would you leave Auburn? Well, you know, you're doing it with Gus. Sometimes you were calling, yeah. sometimes he was. And, and that's fine. And you just kind of reach a, time in your development and coaches have with me as a matter of fact fantastic coaches johnny brewer who's been with me for yeah. 11 years just took the oc job at duke 100 it was time yeah. for him i mean i hate that he's not here i i haven't coached without him for 11 years but like it's awesome for him and i was in that same boat like i can't keep developing until i get out on my own and and make my own mistakes and figure yeah. out it's a lot harder than maybe i think you know because until you've sat in that seat as the play caller or the head coach or whatever that next stage is, you really never know what it's like till you've been there. 
Totally. It's yeah. kind of like first time you get married or the first time you become a parent, there's no manual for it. They just hand you a kid and say, get out of here. And you're like, <laughs> Good luck. you can do that, you know? And so you have to be there. It's real easy to say what parents should do until you have a kid. And it's the oh, same yeah. thing with being a play caller. It's real easy to sit in a staff room and go, I don't know why we just don't do this or this or that or that until you sat in that chair. And so I think that's good for development. And so I, I was going to go after the 15th season and the last second, you know, Gus, hey, I want you to stay. I didn't want to go. We loved Auburn. So I stayed one more year, probably than I should have. Uh, I say should have, who knows how it would have worked out. It's worked out fine. But a year later, the, really the only place to go to, to break away and kind of bet on yourself and start to develop and all that was, was UConn. Mm-hmm. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity. When I did, I went to UConn and then SMU for two and then Miami for two and, and obviously now back here. And, and those five or, or so years really helped me grow a ton as a coach, learn what I believed in. Obviously the foundation I'd been given by others was, was super helpful and kind of just, you know, create your own personality and what you believe in as a play caller and as an offensive coach. And uh, it's kind of – it's been fun. A lot of it was hard. The first few years, I mean, it was painful, you know. But yep. you came out on the other side and you kind of kind of feel good because you feel like you went out and you earned it maybe and, um, and learned a lot in the process. No, 100%. And, you know, I specifically think back to those two years you had at SMU and the two years you had at Miami – it really seemed like you were starting to have a bit of an identity. Um, I know just from like the tempo stuff you were doing, FIB, formation of the boundary, unbalanced stuff, like it seemed like you were kind of formulating a little bit of your identity there. When you go from being, you know, the offensive coordinator, and I'm, I'm assuming at Miami it was with a defensive head coach, with Coach Diaz, right? It was, it was defensive guy? Yes. And yep. then becoming a head coach, you've kind of established this identity of what you want to do offensively. How do you handle that transition to the head coaching role? Did you want to keep calling plays? Did you realize, like, I have to go a different direction here? What was your attitude there? Yeah, uh, the first and last part of your question, I mean, it was about 2019, the second year I was OC at SMU, when I feel like really it clicked of who we wanted to be. Yeah, and for sure. that was the year we had a really good year. Went ten and two, and then I went to Miami, and that's kind of the style we've been ever since. Um, you know, we decided we wanted to play fast, we wanted to spread the field, we wanted to throw it vertically down the field. We do a yep. lot of FIB stuff in college, a lot of unbalanced, and and still run the football. And um, so that was a big year for me and for the development of what we do. And then to your question about the the transition, so I think it helped that I had those years SMU and two at Miami to really feel good about what I believed in and what we were doing and, and not just have one good year, but we had back to back to back to back, you know, we had several years of success where it's like, okay, we know what we're doing sound, it works. And so coming here, um, you know, I don't know if I wanted to or not call plays, you know, I enjoy, um, I enjoy being with people. I enjoy leading. I enjoy grabbing a staff or a group of players and bringing them all together and going for a common goal. I don't look at myself as some play call guru or think I'm even great at it. Like I enjoy competing. So on game day, that's how I get to compete now because I can't throw it anymore. And um, so I don't know if I like wanted to call plays or not, but when I got the job, I tried to sit back and learn from, you know, my experiences with Gus and, and seeing guys like Manny Diaz and Blake Baker and people that were really close, but one was the head coach and one was the coordinator. And was like, how do you do that? And yeah, yeah. You know, I kind of, I kind of landed on, I'm going to start out calling plays and there's two reasons. One, my job is now the head coach. It's not the offensive coordinator. And so as the head coach, my job is to do whatever I think gives us the best chance to win. Yeah. So year to year, I'm going to self-evaluate. And if I think me giving, calling the plays gives us the best chance to win, then I'm going to do it. And the moment I don't think it gives us the best chance to win, I won't. Um, the second reason, especially starting out, is I, I had to remind myself, hey, you got hired for a reason. Yeah, for sure. So why don't you help establish that identity, that culture, that expectation? It's a lot easier to do that and then let someone else take it and run with it and make it their own than not. And then if it's not going well and you try to step in and that's just not great. And, and I didn't want to put anyone else in that position. So I decided to call plays, and I think the only way I was able to do it 
especially being a first time head coach and, and over these two years is having great people around me. I mean, 100%. it's who you hire and, and having someone I've known since we worked together at 09 at Auburn, we won a national title together and Casey Woods come in and be the office coordinator, someone I know I can trust, spent all that time together with me and Gus. Then he went off with Eli, who's kind of in our little tree at, at Missouri. Mm -hmm. So he didn't yep. really know what we had started doing over the last four or five years in terms of being on the staff, but we knew each other. We knew there's a trust factor there and yes. we complement each other well. And then having at the time, like I said, Johnny Brewer had been with me 11 years through that whole evolution. And then Rob Likens and Garen Justice and Kyle mm -hmm. Cooper, who had been with me at Miami. There's so many guys that now know what we do. Yeah. That it's not like I have to sit in there and teach an offensive staff. You know, if not all, four or all those guys, they kind of know what we do. And so they're able to take it and run with it when I got to go be the head coach, but they're also able to hopefully add value and help us evolve year in and year out and not get stale. Yeah, no, I, I love that perspective. That's, it's been so interesting over the last maybe two or three years and the conversations that we on the podcast are having with coaches where there's such a debate over, can you be a head coach and call plays? And, you know, it's, it's very interesting to hear different <laughs> coaches kind of explain their philosophy on it. And I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's like, as you're evaluating that, you know, why, why'd you get the job? Like in a lot of, in a lot of respects, it's obviously leadership ability and organization and all of that, but also the success you had as a play caller is a big reason why you had an opportunity to do that. And so it's just interesting to hear people, especially now that you're dealing with so much roster management as a head coach, um, how they, <laughs> I, yeah. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, you know, there, it, it, there's challenges on your time for sure, but you have to sort all that out every year. And I, and I don't think it's a one size fits all. I, the debate's yeah. great. I think it's everybody's different. I think it's for sure. Coach, for sure. The person, like some people, they can do both. Some people can't, some people can for a while. Like, and so to say, should you or shouldn't you? I mean, I think yeah. every situation is totally different. No, that makes a ton of sense for sure. Well, one of the, the kind of themes that we talk about a lot on the podcast is, you know, we've been saying it for a couple of years now, we think that the most important or most significant relationship on the football field, and this is biased because it's an offensive podcast, but we, we feel like that the most significant relationship is between a, a quarterback and a play caller throughout your time as a play caller and a quarterback coach. What can you say about the relationship that you've developed with those guys and how they were able to kind of almost become an extension of you and your thought process on the field? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. It, that's the most critical relationship in our sport um, because especially if you like to play like we do in modern football and spread yeah. the field and play with tempo and throw it all over the yard and have all those, you know, whether it's some people check with me, other people just have all the answers built in. Like, man, if you're calling plays, uh, you have to have a great relationship and understanding of each other. You know, you've got to get to the yeah. point where the QB understands why you're calling certain things. But you also have to call things that you know that that QB can execute and believe in. And it just, it just it's critical. And, and, and that's another, going back to the last question of why I was able to call plays the first two years and hopefully will continue is, you know, Johnny Brewer had been with me for nine years. Yeah. He sat with yeah. me in the QB room at Miami for two and here at SMU. And he'd been at Auburn with, in like, so to let him coach the quarterbacks and me call plays, knowing that I could sit in that room during the season and let him coach the quarterbacks, but listen. Yeah and chime in and make sure that, you know, me and Tanner or me and Preston were on the same page. Same thing now with the transition of Derek King. Well, that's a guy yep. I got to coach. I've had that relationship with. He and I know each other, but then I also know how he's going to coach those guys. Yeah. I think that's really critical because, um, man, he's the coach on the field, and he's playing and I'm not. Yeah. And if I like it, it don't matter how great that play is if he doesn't like it or can't execute it. And – um, so I've got to know, I can't tell you how many times, and I've, it's been an evolution. You know, when you're a young coach, like, man, it's a great play. I don't know why we don't run it. Or, you know, this is this, or this is that. Well, look, if the quarterback don't like it, it's your <laughs> job. It's your job to either make him like it yep, or get rid of it. Delete and, it. And, you yep. know, and I ask my guys, I'm like, okay, like, give me some feedback in fall camp or start game plan. Like, okay, like in fall camp, when you're trying to build your kind of identity for that season around your quarterback and your team, you might take – five concepts and be like, okay, QB, Hey, tell me, do you love it? Are you good with it? Like you like it, you understand it and you're <laughs> yeah. good with it. You, you hate it. Do not call that coach or I don't know, but I, I need more reps. Yeah. You know? and, yeah, yeah. 
And it helps me because, look, if he says, I hate it, it's out. It's not Come in on. the offense this year, guys. We're yeah. not running it. We're not going to try to force it down his throat, no matter how yeah, much yeah. of a comfort level it is for me. If he loves it, we're, it's going to grow. And then yeah. if he's like, I don't know, I need more reps, or I like it, but I need more reps to feel great about it, then that's what we're going to rep and build 100%. on. 100%. And because if it's third and eight and we got to have it, I need to call the right play or the best play I can, but I need to call the play he feels the best about too. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. That's the balance you're trying to find, and you can't you can't do that consistently at a high level if there's not an incredible connection with the play caller and the quarterback. No, I I agree a hundred percent with what you're saying. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here with this question, um, and I don't I don't want any of your quarterbacks to get jealous of each other here. But you've been around a lot of quarterbacks, okay? A lot of great ones. Oh, if your headset goes out, I'm not asking you for your favorite. But your headset goes out. Who who you trust in to call a drive by himself, on the ball, let it rip. And maybe okay, it's somebody. I mean, yeah, I mean, I got to say our quarterbacks that are here right now, no they're playing for no me. Doubt. Right? I mean, of the, of if I'm excluding the quarterbacks that are currently on our roster at SMU that I'm coaching, you know, Preston totally. and Kevin and those guys. Um, man, that's a great question. I'd say there's two. There's two. Okay. One of them's coaching the quarterback room for me right now, and Derek King. Go. I would give Derek King the keys. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, people. So this, you know, he hurt his knee at the end of the first year, so he didn't go through spring before the second right. year. Yeah. And in our Miami spring game that was on the ACC network, I let him call the last two or three drives. Of Did the spring you really? Game. Gave him. The I need to go back and look at it. <laughs> and I mean, he was throwing it deep like every play, right? Every play. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I trust him. And then the other one is Ryan Applin. Ryan Applin, okay. I believe, just been elevated. Arkansas to State? Georgia. He was at Arkansas State. Arkansas when they State, had him okay. one year. Yeah, yeah. Now Georgia Southern does a great job. Awesome. Ryan had yeah. an incredible competitiveness. Like he had that, yeah. like kind of that Tom Brady feel of a competitor. And he understood the game. He understood space. And I think I'd, give, I'd throw the keys to either one of those two dudes, and they'd call it right up and down the field. Probably call it better than I would. And I might not have a job. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I got to be a little biased toward Preston Stone as well. He's quite a, quite a player, pretty sharp, competitive in his own right. He's a, a Texas private school legend from Parish Episcopal. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a, it was a rival of the team I coached down here in Houston. So uh, he's, yeah. he's a special one, man. He's a special one. That's for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So you know, we're we're getting to the end here. I want to make sure we re respectful your time and get you in and out on time here. But uh, you know, just just a couple couple last questions that I wanted to, to touch on. Uh, you had mentioned before we jumped on here, um, your relationship with your wife going on, is it 17 years of marriage? How significant has that relationship yep. been in your, the growth in your career and the, the moves that you guys have made together over the years? Oh, it, there's not a, there's not a word that will tell you how significant it is. I mean, she's, my wife, Lauren, is just incredible. And I thank all the coaches' wives out there that allow us to coach. It gets said a lot, um, whether it's the hours you work or the pressure that you're under. Um, you know, I mean, all the times that I'm dealing with a lot of other things that have nothing to do with her and I maybe snap off and I'm a complete idiot and she doesn't deserve that. And she loves me anyways at some point uh, because she knows, you know, where maybe it's coming from and just the grace that's given there, but just to do yeah. it as a team. Like we, we kind of made that commitment. Um, matter of fact, back in 2009, when we were going to Auburn, when I was getting back in, yeah. it was like, Hey, let's go try this out for two years. Let's give it two years. And if something works great. And if it doesn't work, we can come back to Northwest Arkansas and coach high school ball or get a job at whatever, what, you know, and it's funny, we go down in 09, have our first year, 2010, a guy named Cam Newton shows up. We win the national title, and I'm an OC <laughs> at Sanford, and we're having our first kids. And so the two-year number worked. But, you know, every year um, she's the one who keeps me pretty grounded. Like yeah. two yeah. quick stories. One, we're Florida State, Miami. Uh, we beat them 52-10 to 10 my first year there. That was a good night. It was a good night. Stay no back doubt. with the coaches. Ed Reed was there. We were all hanging out in the locker room. I said, babe, I'm going to be late. Great. I get back in at like 1, 2 a.m. I'm just as happy as can be. And I get in bed, thinks she's asleep. She just kind of rolls over and gives me a hug and goes, hey, just remember, you're not a big deal. <laughs> and I'm like, I never said I was, you know. And um, But every year in, in end of July, right before we go start fall camp, and it's kind of like for families, they're like, okay, here we go. Like, yep, see you yep. in six months, jokes. Um, I asked her the question, like, 
what do you think? And the question to her is, am I doing what I'm called to do? Is this what we're supposed yeah. to be doing? And is my family and our relationship suffering because of what I'm doing? Mm. And if it is, yeah. she has the ability to say yes. And I'm out after that season. Yeah. And every year so far, she said, no, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So that's amazing. That, that relationship is like you said, most important one bar none out there. And we're really grateful for, I'm, I just celebrated my ninth year and nine year anniversary, been coaching the whole time and, uh, very grateful for my wife and all the support awesome, that she's man. given me along the way. So you, you definitely can't beat it. Well, last, last question before we get you off here, you guys are transitioning to the ACC, uh, going to go compete at a, at a really high level. And it seems like SMU is pouring resources and there's a ton of excitement about that transition. And when me and Rashad were at the Texas high school coaches convention, um, I guess it was about a year ago. Uh, you did a great job getting up there and speaking to the coaches. And what I appreciated is you went in and you broke down a whole ga a whole game and you talked through your um, your play calling philosophy. And if you guys have a chance, you definitely go back and watch that talk. It was phenomenal. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you on your way out here what it means for you to be coaching in the state of Texas with all these great high school coaches and what it looks like for SMU to kind of be that flagship program heading into the ACC. Yeah, it means a lot. I mean, I'm blessed to be in the state of Texas where the high school coaching is just at an elite level. There's so many of these coaches who could come into college and coach circles around a lot of us. And um, I'm also a product of I learned and was developed by three high school coaches. My dad was a 100%. high school coach for eight years. Gus was my high school coach and gave me a lot of opportunities. And Chris Wood was my other high school coach and, and junior high coach. And like, I just learned everything from high school coaches and they impacted my life in such a way that, you know, I feel honored to get to do that in this state. Um, mm -hmm. And I, everything I do from play calling philosophy to in game to build, it comes from a high school background, a high school philosophy of who I was taught under and how I learned. And I think that's what makes us a little different than, you know, the stereotypical pro or college offense that kind of plays within the rules. Um, the only rule I know is we're trying to score points and, <laughs> yeah. um, and throw it deep a lot. But, um, of course. Of course. you know, and so I think, I think it's just really cool. You know, growing up in the state of Arkansas, everything was always bigger in Texas. And, and to get to coach in this state with so many incredible high school coaches and what the THSCA does for coaches in this state, both high school and college is second to none. And so to be going to the ACC at a school like SMU where Doak Walker played and, you know, I mean, the Cotton Bowl is called the house that Doak built, you know, and no you know, Eric Dickerson and Craig James and those guys came here and did what they did and the history we have here. But now to be moving into the ACC and to be the only Division One school in Dallas, like, I'm just blessed and I'm humbled to get to do it. And no uh, don't take it for granted and, and know there's a lot of hard work ahead of us. We're moving up in weight class and – I think we can compete. We've proven we can compete with all the teams that are on next year's schedule, but we've never done it 10 weeks in a row, you know, not for 40 years here. And so that grind week in, week out, you ask the four teams that went to the Big 12 last year, it's a different grind. No doubt. So, yeah. But, man, the challenge is exciting, and, and I'm just really excited to, to get to go do it. And we're not no going to change who we are. We're going to be aggressive. We're going to try to play fast and physical, and we're going to throw it deep and play with tempo and, and see how it works out. I love it, man. Well, we're excited to follow along, and we'll definitely be watching. Have to come up to uh, come up to Dallas and, and check you guys out soon for sure, man. I, I really appreciate you jumping on with us and, and spending some time with us. We'd love to have you. You got to bring some of those cool books you got. I got and, you. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd love to have you guys come up, check out a practice, or hang out with us a little bit in the office. No doubt, we'll we'll be up there for sure. Well, I appreciate you, man. Best of luck this season, and uh, good luck to SMU as well. Victory is a great play call.